Hi everyone. Sorry to drag you after lunch to a session, but uh, uh, and this is the killer session. You know, I'm sure all of us are dying to go to get a nap in between the later sessions and this one. Anyway, for whatever it is worth, uh, please allow us to present a panel on the future of independent publishing. Uh, I'll introduce the uh, speakers in the order in which they will make their presentations. And uh, a brief introduction, you know, the details are there in the, on the website in the material that you have. Uh, but before that, I'd like to just introduce to you the, uh, the organization or the platform that has put this panel together as it were, apart from, of course, uh, Leo and the Publishing Next team and Cinema team. Uh, we are all uh, uh, associates of an organization called the IPDA, short for Independent Publisher Distribution Alternative. Uh, as the name suggests, we are a group of independent publishers who have come together to set up a distribution platform or mechanism that will serve not only the needs of the <coughs> member publishers, eight of us who came together to form this, but also the needs, hopefully, of more and more independent publishers across the country as we go on. Now, primarily independent publishers who publish in English, we hope to grow to include publishers who publish in other Indian languages as well. Sorry, two of our member publishers publish in other languages. What I meant was not others who, uh, Mandira, who heads up Street Samir, publishes in Bengali, Radhika, who uh, publishes uh, children's books, publishes in, as you know, uh, nine Indian languages. Uh, what I meant was other language publishing publishers from who are outside of the member publishers. Uh, the aim, I mean, the reason for which IPDA came together was uh, a contingent one when we did set ourselves up. Uh, it is headed by Amrita Akhil, who is the director of marketing, and she has a team of uh, four to five people who do the marketing and sales and distribution of IPDA. Uh, and the reason why eight of us came together to set it up with Amrita's help uh, was because uh, it was a contingent one, a contingent one, as I told you, was because. Uh, many of us face a situation where our traditional distribution houses uh, were either winding up or folding up or were moving to distributing other kinds of books. They weren't, in short, interested in the small volume that we were supplying to them. Um, and we said, if we can't uh, beat them, let's join them, uh, join the system, that is. Uh, so we said, let's get together and have strength in numbers. And if we put together the small lists, the more, more modest lists as compared to some of the other big publishers, uh, if all these books come together under one umbrella platform, uh, we would be able to make up the numbers that are needed for visibility, as we all know, for marketing and distribution. And then, of course, extend the base to any other small publisher. So the publishers who are part of the IPDA platform base uh, could be new publishers, could be tiny publishers, could be, uh, you know, the new in the sense chronologically, it could range from publishers that were set up as recently as six to seven years ago, which is when IPDA was set up, uh, to publishers that have a track record of, say, 25 years. Uh, niche publishers mostly publishing in a certain area of interest. Uh, many of them, many of us pioneers and part breakers in that field. Um, and now we extend uh, the distribution and marketing services to as many independent publishers as we can possibly accommodate, resources and other facilities allow. That's the spiel on IPDA for you. And now to introduce our speakers. Um, Amrita Akhil, as I mentioned, is the director of marketing of IPDA. And uh, she's been in publishing and marketing. She has a, uh, uh, she was earlier with uh, Katha and uh, 
before I came here was set up, she worked with Tata as the team leader of the marketing and sales. And that's where many of us, in fact, <coughs> met with her and interacted with her. And then she left Tata, and it was after that that we requested her to come in and head up the IPDA team. <coughs> uh, the next person who will speak is Alvito, who has given us a very small profile, but he runs a bookstore, a book selling service called Focus Bookstore in Bangalore. Um, he has worked with students' movements, NGOs, before beginning this business of uh, free press facilities for book printing as well as the Focus Book Services, uh, book selling services as well, the bookshop itself. Uh, and he's been actively involved in the marketing division of both the, the, the print, pre print, print services as well as the uh, bookshop itself. The next person in line would be Radhika Menon, and uh, she has already been introduced in the morning session, so I won't go into details. She um, heads up uh, Tulika Publishers in Chennai, uh, which publishes children's books, and she's wearing her IPDA hat <coughs> at this session. Similarly, Mondira Sen, who heads up Sri Samya in Kolkata, uh, one of the pioneers of uh, published uh, books on uh, uh, women's studies, gender studies, as well as caste. Um, and she comes from uh, Calcutta in English as well as in Bangla. Uh, she, she, you will get to hear her again tomorrow uh, in the session on copyright. Uh, but I'll just give you <clears throat> a few more details. She's the 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 company is called Bhaskar and Sen. She has her experience in publishing goes back to uh, 1972, so she's a veteran in the field. Um, and after spending a number of years working with other publishing houses, she came back and started this company of her own. She formed a company called Mandira to begin with, 1984. The two imprints, as I told you, that she uh, brings out from uh, Bhaskar and Sen is Sri and Samya. So Sri Samya is how you would know her. She is also a partner member of Independent Publishers Distribution of the Thank you. Now over to Amrita, who will speak about uh, this session is basically on the future of Indian publishing, uh, of independent publishing in India. Uh, what are the new forms of collaboration and uh, networks and platforms that we can think of uh, in the field of independent publishing? And how have each of us approached this challenge? Um, what are the uh, solutions we have found, if at all, if any at all? Uh, what are the uh, uh, opportunities, what are the challenges. Uh, we hope to cover at least some of the terrain on all these fronts. And uh, we, of course, would like to involve all of you in the discussion as far as possible, because we would like to learn from uh, your comments, your ideas on this uh, fairly unique experiment that we have launched on. Although it is six years old, we are still very open to uh, discussion and to learn from others. So, forms of collaboration, forms of initiatives in the in the field of independent publishing is broadly what we we cover. Amrita. Graphic novels, fiction, children's literatures, 
children literature, memoirs, spiritual, new age, academic, and so on. I, I could have missed few. And the product categories in which we have categorized them are trade and journal, which are fiction and non-fiction, <laughs> educational and academic books, which mainly comprise of school and college textbooks and reference. So three major categories, which are journal and trade books, school and academic reference. How are the books marketed in these categories? There's a simple market model, a basic model for any business where there are two entities, or I must want to know. There's a basic business model where there are two entities and four relationships that flow. Here we've taken an example of a publisher and a reader. The publisher does promotion, the reader gives us feedback, and there's a supply chain and a payment. This is a basic model which is there for any business. Marketing system for journal or trade books, publisher. The target audience here is the journal reader. How do we reach? The direct impact is through promotion which is reviews, book launches, write-ups, and the other is, for this we need to reach to the market, to the bookshops, for which the distributor is appointed and which are we, and we go to the retail outlets, show the catalogs and get the orders. For the new titles, it's the advanced materials to which we get the orders. So in this process, the publisher reaches directly the journal reader through the book launches, through reviews, and we in turn go to the bookshops, make sure that the books are available. Finally, the bookshops order, and payment comes to us, which is given to the publisher. For academic books, The books have to reach the library for which the faculty is approached and the faculty takes a decision ensures that the books are there in the library and the end user gets the books. For school market, it's basically a textbook market. Sales for us mainly come from bookshops. Some sales come from library purchase or by getting books prescribed as supplementary readers. The incidence of these sales are too scattered. So we do not have a data for that. Book exhibition that select schools on select times is a viable option. Institutional promotion can be done for distribution through informal centers run by NGOs. The problems that were faced that distributors of bookshops were reluctant to keep or open many small accounts. The solution that was thought that negotiate exclusive distribution with big publisher or distributor or set up IPTA or similar distribution or serving independence. Promotion effort for independent books in institutional market weak or non-existent. Have IPTA or similar collective independent with full resources to create promotion departments that will be shared across all books. We have done so with the, for our institutional market 
with Istri Samuel for a promotion in East and with Books for Change for a promotion in South. on what is going to happen to bookstores, especially those who encourage the print media. We're going to be dead very right soon. So I thank <laughs> the gentleman for predicting what our future is going to be. Uh, my experience uh, is with an independent bookstore, a small bookstore, for those who know, uh, Bangalore in Malaysia. Okay, And uh, <clears throat> he first began by selling books to NGOs and uh, subsequently to institutional, to libraries, institutional, but mainly of higher learning, because the entire market was very limited. Uh, then we had to opt out of the library market because of our competitors and publishing, and publishers were approaching libraries directly and offering discounts of 20% and more. And it was almost close to the discount that we were getting, so it was not possible to survive. So from that, we moved on to, uh, for the last eight years, a more general bookstore and focusing on children's books. So that's the kind of experience we have. And uh, when we say that, we also, uh, to encourage children reading, we have exhibitions in schools. Later on, while I speak, I'll explain a little bit more uh, what I mean by some other terms we talk about in schools. Uh, what do we mean by independent bookstore? Independent bookstore, we mean a person who normally has one outlet, owns it himself, or is owned by two, three people, but essentially one bookstore, and can take decisions as to what to stock, what not to stock. Unlike possibly a chain bookstore where the manager of a, of one of the branches of the chain doesn't have that kind of independence to choose. And the other is that since chain bookstores have uh, wide numbers, the kind of discounts they get are probably larger than what independent bookstores will get, and therefore they can play around much more than independent bookstores can. So it's a kind of di difference I'm trying to establish between independent bookstores and chain bookstores, because the topic that I'm speaking on is independent bookstores in the face of chain stores. Um, so what are the kind of problems that we face as uh, independent bookstores? One is, <clears throat> from my experience, and I, I think sometimes it takes a longer time, time to, uh, by the time we can break even, is close to five years. Also, we have to decide what kind of uh, Values do we have to preserve the bookstore? What I mean by values is what kind of books do we, do we stock? Do we stock all kinds of books? Do we uh, stock some kind of books? This is crucial to define ourselves for the long run. If we want immediate returns, maybe we could stock everything. So, <clears throat> uh, for example, I mean, I was giving an example, I think, to someone this over lunch. For example, we don't encourage artists. Separately, maybe I could explain to you why I, uh, we don't encourage artists. We don't uh, encourage uh, mates and dates for teenagers. Again, it's very popular among a certain group of people. We we'll sell it. That's sell it very easily. Yeah. The other than mates and dates. Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, chain bookstores claim that they can offer discounts up to eighty percent. The question that we ask is, can we make that claim in the first place? And what are kind of discounts that we should be offering to the individuals who come to the bookstore, institutions that come to the bookstore, what's the maximum we can offer? And beyond that, should be, what, what is the rate that is non-negotiable? These are things that we find are very important to, to, to sustain ourselves in the long run. 
If you play fly by night, you can play around with these uh, needles. The other problem is that certain publishers in the cities are reducing discounts to bookstores. And at the same time, you have uh, the end user, that's the reader, who's asking for higher discounts. Why? Because the other bookstores are offering up to 80% discounts. And many of them have not understood the, 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 the concept of remainder books. I uh, presume most of us or all of us know the concept of remainder books here. Books which are kind of out of stock and which are sold in the way and then we download it. Like we, a lot of other things are downloaded from the West into India. So I, sorry? Okay, sorry. Manjira <laughs> says dump. So I don't know if this question of uh, E-books is also quite a question of dumping. That's a separate issue. Not that I'm against e-books, okay? But it's a question. Uh, <clears throat> because as uh, was that? Radhika was saying that people have access to it is what, 0.5%? <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a view. Okay. Um, uh, Of course, there's also the other, the other problem that publishers are not sending, like I mentioned earlier, sending uh, selling books to the end user directly. Now, in face of this situation, what do we do to survive? What do we do to continue? One is the owner, owners of independent bookstores must have a love for books and other items that they may have, and that's a strong commitment to running a bookstore. Secondly, I think it's quite, quite important that in doing so, you develop a relationship with the buyer. So the buyer knows that he or she can be advised on what to buy and not to buy. And it will be a relationship which is based on certain values. I don't know, maybe outdated in, in some places, but I think the values of, say, honesty, straightforwardness, meeting commitments, are still values that uh, the end user, the buyer, appreciates. And I believe in the long run, th that's what will sustain a bookstore. Other than that, there's also the question of uh, uh, maintaining, uh, being strong on marketing and sales. The location of a bookstore is important. It may not be all important, but it's still important, especially if one wants walking customers. If you want dedicated customers, there is no issue. But if you want walking customers, the place in terms of it should be close to a place where you can park your vehicle, there's a where you require where you can they have other shopping to do. But the walking customer is not what you're dependent on, like we are dependent on them also, not only on dedicated customers. So we have shifted our location to a more commercial area. If we want to uh, run a mail order service, we require a work call system that which we can get a customer database. What we have done is, for example, we offer uh, our customers to become book club members. For 25 rupees, they are book club members for two years, in which they allow discounts of 10% for all books that they buy, or that we may procure for them. Bookstores like ours require to be prudent of making purchases. Where to buy the books, and because some books are, are not returnable. But to learn what we can stock and not stock takes time. The other important thing is to be able to cut down investments, cut down on fancy salaries, which some booksellers sellers do, cut down on rents, and anything that increases and increases operating costs. The another factor which does help is kind of when we have workshops for parents and for children. Because parents continue to look for ways and means of which how they can relate more effectively with their children. So <clears throat> um, workshops is one, the other one is having uh, reading sessions, book reading sessions, which is often ways by which we can retain the customer. From the publisher, we're trying to, not always successfully, to insist on at least 40 
to 45% discount. Otherwise, it's difficult to, to work out the details because we require a minimum of 20% to keep going. Those who give less than that, we have kind of say, uh, unfortunately, some sometimes they have good books, but we cannot uh, uh, stop them. Marketing has been a weak area, and what's important, I think we often miss out, is the question of visibility is a must. And visibility which is continuous and sustained, it cannot be a one-off. If it's a one-off, then we're not going to get, it, it, uh, it has to remain in the memory of the customers, of the people who want to come. It's only then they, they come back to you. It's easy to concentrate on work and not on sales. You need to know your product. You need to know the books that you have. If you don't know it, you're going to find difficulty selling it, difficulty in explaining to the, your customer what is the use of in what way could be beneficial to them. I mentioned about exhibition in schools. Here again, we try to work on very definite terms. We give a certain percentage, 10 to 15% maximum to the school in terms of books. Many schools have asked for cash, they've said no. And this is, mind you, despite our competitors offering incentives to the principal, teachers, parents, and students. <coughs> and uh, it's only by kind of defining this term very clearly, we think, <coughs> we can uh, uh, maintain ourselves. Other things are that, you know, administrative things should be, administrative and account system should be very good. Because in small bookstores, if you don't check where our expenses are extra, we don't have problem. Similarly, <clears throat> you need to look, an owner or owners have to learn everything about a bookstore. <coughs> he or she cannot decide, okay, so only this I'm going to learn and the rest I'm not going to do. Everything that's required to be done in a bookstore, stocking, uh, uh, what's that, uh, present, presentation of the books, selecting purchases, uh, how to sell, how to pack, how to mail, dispatch, all requires to be known if we want to kind of sustain ourselves. So <clears throat> to end, I would say from our, our experience and speaking to others and from reading from my experience from other countries, I repeat what I said earlier, independent books have survived because of relationships they, they develop with their customers that they cannot get either through the net or again. Um, this is uh, uh, a presentation that I did earlier um, uh, at a conference and I thought it was relevant to uh, present it again here because uh, uh, it is about Kulika's experience of her marketing um, multilingual books which is really a huge challenge and uh, Publishers do publish in one or two languages, but we publish in nine languages. We publish, we are publishers of children's books, um, children's books which were, and especially in the in the languages which were heavily, uh, not subsidized, but which is very cheap. Um, you know, 15 rupees and 20 rupees was the uh, price of a book, and uh, the. Um, <coughs> Well, or the experience of uh, publishers and distributors there very clearly pointed not just to the language, even English language publishers, that books, Indian books had to be priced at uh, 15 and 20 or 25 rupees for it to sell, otherwise it wouldn't sell, but the Western imported books, the remainder books largely, which the um, buyers didn't seem to uh, worry about, they, that they would pay more for. We went through all that very difficult. 
struggle through that. And then in, in, in addition to sell in nine different regional language markets. So that experience itself. And also, uh, um, when I did this, what uh, really has struck me was the kind of reports in the papers of late, in the last um, two, three years particularly, about this boom in children's publishing, that that's the way to go. And you, I'm sure all of you being in uh, publishing um, know that there is really, there are so many new publishers. Um, there's this whole buzz about children's publishing, that's the uh, future of publishing, and the bookstores are saying great things, the same book bookstores would refuse to keep our books, so things have changed. And, but I'm just relating to what our own experience is and um, of this whole thing. So I've just taken a few um, newspaper reports. So this is the Financial Express, July 17, 2011, which says it's growing steadily, the children's book market, at 10% um, year on year, children's get and uh, the total English publishing industry was 1,200 crore in 2010, of which children's category accounted for 15%, which is 180 crores. And then you have specific uh, feedback from the leading chain stores. And usually, usually, all, all these reports you will see as I go, it is based on feedback from the chain bookstores never the independent bookstores, they don't matter, the big distributors, the big publishers. At Reliance Time Out, uh, out of the total book stocks, 30% constitutes children's books. It's an optimistic, optimistic start and the segment is bound to grow over time. For Prosper, the children's section contributes almost 30% of its book sales, of which over 15% are Indian books. We foresee a surge in the growth of children's books in Landmark, which contributes 25% of the entire book sales, so, you know, rosy figures. Then there is children's book market grows up. Um, I think this is an online report. And uh, it's, it's uh, as uh, early as 2004, that's when, you know, the things started changing. And you have somebody like um, the Jashan Bhatt, who is a um, veteran in the field of Strand Bookstore, who says 15 years ago, the children's book market was three crore one. Now, thanks to educated parents and aspiring salaries, it's a 100 crore market. Today, for an average Indian parent of a pre-primary or primary school teacher staying in a metropolis, books account for 50% of the total money spent on recreation. This is from a very successful bookseller called Madhuri Sonawala, proprietor of Butterfly Books. You all may be familiar here because she operates in Bombay. Um, uh, in and around Bombay and Ahmedabad and so on. Wonderful books, um, meaning she imports them directly. <coughs> and some of the books that you don't see in bookstores, uh, she either has an agency or she imports them. And those days, when I was looking for books for my children or the school, I taught them, and she, that is one of the um, places you could really get good books. Um, very expensive. And uh, she says that they were, people were spending more and more money. But if you go on, it says 200 copies of black and white sold in a year, a book for newborn babies, priced at rupees 125. These books are black and white. So she's obviously got, I'm not sure if it is remained there, but it has um, I mean 125, and this is extremely um, marked down price. Uh, so it's for a newborn baby, and it's about visual, um, just a visual book for babies. Who, uh, and babies who respond to visuals like that. The House of Invention is another bestseller. Each of the book opens on to an elaborately set up drawing room, kitchen, bedroom, and so on, uh, complete with microwave ovens, television sets, and cupboard popping out of the pages. So you get the idea of what kind of book it is. It is one of those innovative pop-up books. The boom in Indian markets implies merry-making for publishers in UK, Australia, and the US. I mean, it's there in the, in, in the report. So that's what it means when you say boom. What it means is a boom for the publishers who are importing into India. Indian publishers haven't yet learned to cater to the specific demand for interactive innovative books, so the market is flooded with imported ones. But in another 15 years, we will have in independent publishers in the arena too. So we are kind of getting there. <coughs> And then at the other end of the spectrum, you have, uh, not really, Hindi is somewhere in between Hindi, the Hindi language book market. We, uh, after
in English. Actually, we do as well in Hindi as well as English. Our Hindi books sell as much as the English books. Um, and that is after so many years. Whereas the Hindi book publishers feel that they are losing out to the English book market. The country still this book market, both Hindi and English, is around seven, roughly 700 million. But if we talk about sales ratio, then it is 30, 70 for Hindi and English. So they perceive a huge gap between the Hindi language book market and the English language book market. Then you come to a phenomenon called Harry Potter, which as we all know, Manju Publishing House shot to fame because they published Harry Potter in Hindi. And you know they, their sales far outstripped the English language sales, I mean, considering it's in, in, in uh, a language like Hindi, because it sold 40,000 copies spectacular by the standards of Indian fiction. The most quoted, interviewed, and artistically photographed Indian literary figures who write in English sell less than 10,000 copies here. And um, he says he sold 5,000 copies in the first three weeks of release. And they're not cheaply priced. Um, I haven't got the price here. But uh, that's the kind of success they made out of his. So riding on the success of Harry Potter itself, and then the films, he did a reprint when the films were released, but in Hindi. And um, yes, this is the latest um, uh, story that came recently in their book market, was third largest for English language publishing as a boom and crisis. Top end, so now on the other side of the picture, top end publishers are taking big bets, but book retailers are struggling. The business of selling books is set for a wrenching change. And one of the reasons is overexpansion. That is, uh, yeah, well, Thomas Abraham of Heshit India, which is true, which I think any of us who are in the business feel that it is overexpansion. Huge um, bookstore space, um, bookstore spaces which needs to be filled with books, but are they selling? They are not, so you publishers get huge returns. They don't pay because the books have been sold, so it's a kind of vicious cycle. And um, so this is a kind of reliance time on bookshop. There are 25 stores, crossword, 82 stores, landmark 16 stores. But a chain like crossword, um, you, you know, with 82 stores, and, and we've had you know, many meetings with them because they were the one, for one of the first to say that their children's book section does the best. And the buyer there got in touch with us saying, your books do very well. So you would expect at least 82 or 75 copies of a book to be ordered. Of course not. It's just about 15, 20, or 25, and all to Bombay or Pune, Bangalore. So what that system is, how it uh, um, works, I mean, nobody really knows. I mean, that is, uh, we had a, um, there was one instance when a crossword um, consignment came back after a year as returns. And we looked at it, and we realized that it hadn't even been opened. So it was lying in their go down. And then when we started um, raising a stink about it, we were told that the person who was handling it moved on. And they, it didn't show up on their computers. And for one year, they didn't take, because they were updating their computer technology in Singapore. I mean, it, it really is so frustrating to deal with the, <laughs> with the bookstores and the kind of problems uh, they create. Oxford is a kind of non-starter. It never happened. And they have a children's bookstore in uh, Calcutta. The first not the first, we started the children's first children's bookstore, but Oxford has a children's bookstore in Calcutta. And they never had, they didn't even bother to keep the Tuleka books while yeah, imported stuff, while well, the Delhi store had, because Amrita had been there. So uh, what I'm talking about is what is the system? You know, where, the, if, if you have a computer, efficient computerized system where it's all centralized, that's the reason they give us for anything else, payments being related. So, but when it comes to ordering, there's just no system. Then you, and, and I think in language publishing, there is some remarkable um, um, marketing successes by small regional publishers. Um, it is a very corrupt market, extremely, especially the children's book market, and that's really because of, you know, I have a slide later. Um, it is about government buying huge numbers, which English language publishers can't even think about. It's in lakhs, and we've sold one book thanks to a transparent system set up by NCRT and the former visionary director of NCRT, solely for that reason, Dr. Krishna Kumar. 
uh, a selection was made that was circulated and UP government took the first step and ordered one book from Tulika. And we decided we'll take the risk because it's one book. And it's about a lakh and twenty copies. That they, that's a kind of need. And but it's anyway, the orders come um, you know, one after the other. It, it, you really have to put aside everything and do this. And we were glad it was only one. And two years and we're still collecting money. And when we, we have to collect from each district, and when you call them, they ask you, Hama, liye kya hai? <laughs> you know, and then we just say, Gee, hume Hindi kamna, Hindi hai, things like that. And trying to act as if we know nothing about what's happening. We have a bill, we want some money. But uh, I'm told that it works, and we have collected most of it, but two years. So you can imagine, so there are publishers who publish, regional language publishers only publish for this market. And what happens to the body? Because now that we've got into it, um, we realize what is happening, which is even changing, apparently, just the title page and the copyright page. Same book sold over and over again, because you know they're kind of hand in gloves with the government officials there, and uh, the same books are bought. And the publishers making uh, you know huge money, crores, because that's the kind of budgets uh, the governments have. And there's one instance where bills were made, um, uh, money was paid, but no books were sold. So it was just a deal between publishers, and this is in Madhya Pradesh, who had called for all our books for selection. So that's the kind of market it is. But despite that, there are uh, regional language publishers, and to my mind, the success is because they know their market. Uh, and and they work closely with the, they respond to the customer's needs. And this Marathi publisher, it's um, Grantalia, yeah. Uh, Grantalian, who uh, has sold 100,000 titles in the first three months. It's a mobile bookstore, which goes from uh, a village to village, town to town in Maharashtra. Maybe a friend here would be tell us more about it. And um, both Marathi and English titles, 75% uh, percent of the company's stock come, uh, sales are from Marathi. And uh, so he sells now, uh, now he started publishing and prints not less than 5,000 copies because he sells, uh, sells that in a year. So that, those kind of stories, similarly in Kerala, I think the case has been modeled where uh, you know, it was really through um, reading, um, reading festivals and uh, uh, you know, whole, it's a whole um, month-long festival, village to village, where books are sold. These are uh, really big success stories and very local kind of work, uh, marketing efforts. Now for some figures, there are 300 million children in India in the age group of 3 to 14 years. 3% market penetration of children's books, that's 9 million books sold. What it means is in India, 3 books for 100 children, in UK, 6 books for 1 child. So that's the kind of uh, gap we're talking about, and that's the kind of market. The Tulika title uh, catalog has currently 1,025 titles in English, Hindi, Tamil, Malayalam, Kannada, Telugu, Marathi, Gujarati, and Bhavya, and the numbers are there. Tulika has worked with more than 100 authors, illustrators, and translators, publishers in a wide range of categories in 2 to 14 uh, years, including young adults, bilingual picture books in English plus 8 languages for 2 to 8 years, picture books in 9 languages for 2 to 8 years, fiction for 8 plus, non-fiction for 8 plus, teaching resources uh, in English, all those are in English. On an average, about 25 titles a year, 25% of the books are printed in English, 75% This is a kind of overall, I mean, how we have grown and what the marketing efforts have been. We're going to try to put it together. What it means is when we started in 1996, we, like all publishers, looked um, at bookstores, distribu um, distributors, and the book fairs. And uh, we were one of the very early ones to set up a website. Somebody told us, you know, why don't you? We said, yes, we set up the web, uh, website. It won the best designed website. I'm talking about 1998 or something. So we just had four or five books. And um, 
So we had the website, not my sales, just the excitement of having a website with e-commerce. Uh, good books marketing. So then we started our own marketing and distribution, and this was with Tara Publishing in Chennai because they were also struggling. We started around the same time. Um, you know, how do we uh, market our books? It was really a huge uh, um, roadblock. So we um, got together, started Good Books, started marketing our books together, which was a struggle again, because ours was so both independent publishers, very niche, very what is seen as niche kind of books. Our first book was a bilingual book. We were told, why are you doing in two languages? Schools don't allow it. Take off the Tamil, give us only the English. You know, that was the kind of, and everyone in Delhi, the, the people I went to for advice said, you're not going to be able to sell these books at 65 rupees. It's far too expensive. And that was the language. So these, that was the kind of feedback. And you know, we were in that market. So we came together and Tara did, you know, hand, uh, uh, screen printed uh, books and you know that was just seen as far too expensive no one was buying them so we struggled and uh, the struggle continued and uh, then it was about going to schools and uh, meeting the teachers and so on and trying to sell the books through book fairs but we had far, very few books then and uh, um, we started taking other children's publishers' books, but at that point, Tara said they you know, couldn't continue with this because the publishing was getting affected. They pulled out. We continued. It was a struggle, and um, but the good books. Uh, that's when we thought of a bookstore, meaning it seemed that you know if we had a bookstore and you had all the books, that's what was needed to create an awareness. Indian books, uh, not just Indian books. We did keep imported books too, but really selected. We sat down and selected the books. Struggled for another four or five years with the bookstore, and then it just became too much to handle, and we had to close close down when well, uh, we had to move and rents we couldn't afford the rent, so we closed down the bookstore. But in the meantime, we had a good books trust. So the, those were the kind of which is still there. The good books trust still continues. So, well, I won't go into it, but the trust is there, and currently we're working on setting up a children's uh, review site with Wipro partnering with Pro, um, uh, Foundation and that is to set up a website with, for reviews of children's books and in languages too. You know, so it's just, uh, and we're beginning with a wonderful, uh, arch a really valuable archive of reviews from 1976 onwards, which the uh, book review from Delhi, the book review um, uh, journal, um, carried every November they carry do a children's special but before that they did have children's books in it so it really is very valuable material for research for any student of children's literature because nowhere do we have that so we're putting that online and then we'll continue to do uh, children's review so that is happening that's the good books trust activity right now and we started co-publishing in different languages. That way, we were just doing 200, 250 books in each language, which as everyone knows is a very unviable number, but that's all we could manage because there was no market for those books. But with co-publishing, so we come, um, one of the real success stories with co-publishing is with uh, uh, the Kerala Balasahitya Institute. Ruben uh, de Cruz is here, the director of uh, the institute. And, uh, you know, um, they sell about uh, at least a minimum of 5,000 copies in, in uh, seven to eight months or in a year, and you know, 10, 15,000, much cheaper. But then it's a royalty. They pay us royalty for um, uh, for the books. And the books have really made an impact because they're very different. They're, they're not the usual kind of books that uh, have been published in a regional language. So they're far more far-reaching um, influences than just the numbers sold, but the numbers sold are significant. We haven't sold any <coughs> language books like that, and very steady. So co-publishing, so we have co-publishing with Eklavya, we have co-publishing with Jyotsna Prakashan, uh, we're now um, co-publishing with a Nepali publisher. So, you know, co-publishing is a very good route to take, especially when you do uh, regional language publishing. And the international rights sales, which we have sold from day one. And then we formed ITE, especially when Good Books wound up, we too were left without distributor. 
and uh, so we joined hands all of us and started IPDA. And IPDA, of course, too, and then to independent bookstores and non-bookstores, network of small distributors in India, that's our network now, networks of independent distributors overseas. We work with small distributors overseas because the big distribution is just close to you and submissions for government selection and for book promotion activities, all those, the, the ones in the lighter color are all that, book events and workshop storytelling, classroom learning activities. We send out a fortnightly newsletter, e-newsletters, social media network, mini sites for books, online promotions and offers. And we have the online, uh, we are on several online bookstores, online review sites, then we have district book fairs for government schools, which we have got into. I won't go into it. That's another uh, military operation, shall I say. But you know, it really is. But we did it in Karnataka. And then uh, there is the Tulika website, which is finally getting a, not just a facelift. We you know, have to revamp it because we did it so many years back. And it's really become very difficult to navigate. But it has the online sales have steadily picked up. So it's time for us to do a new website. Hopefully by the end of the year we'll have that. Now we have a Tulika book club. Again, these are schools, play schools that approached us and we have started a Tulika book club there where they showcase all the books. And then there are the e-books, apps, games, merchandise, books plus products, audio books, books in braille, tactile books, textbooks, supplementary readers, animation, film, television, that too. Nothing has taken off, but we had we have signed and got a, a, a handsome advance, I must say, for one series, and then came the recession, and that was the end of the project. But there is a obviously you know great opening there, and now we have again another collective that we have formed as a publishers action group, um, ensuring quality children's books called Page. This is some of our children's publishers who publish in languages have come together to fight this um, corruption in, uh, in, in government selection. You know, for fighting for transparency, fighting for uh, a good selection of children's books. And I think that's the only kind of thing that would work, a collective action, because it's impossible to tackle it. Not that we can tackle it, but at least we make ourselves heard. So that is the latest. Because retail is only 7%, so we can really exist without retail. But, you know, retail is about visibility in the market, showcasing it matters to authors and the illustrators to see their bookstores, uh, uh, books in bookstores, as uh, Kiruba would say. And um, so that's only 7%. This is despite what the crossword and the biggest bookstores are saying about how much they have, uh, uh, how much uh, children's book sales account for their overall sales. And NGOs, 6% six uh, and direct marketing, you have schools, retail, rights, online and others. Online is still negligible as you can see, but I'm very uh, uh, hopeful that even this year there'll be a big difference because things are really changing. So what the, to sum up, the strategy grows organically but requires planning at every stage. It develops building block by building block but requires sudden shifts and changes in accordance with the market demands and new opportunities. What is happening in the market is foreseeable to some degree but the timing is often unpredictable. So on your toes all the time and I think that goes for all of us independent publishers.
but really it's um, accelerated from about the 70s and 80s. And uh, I, the last issue of The Economist, which I think the new one today, uh, had this uh, grim uh, account of what's happening in publishing. But they did say that something that these traditional publishers have contributed is uh, this creation of knowledge, this nurturing of authors. Uh, they called us venture capitalists. But I remember an earlier issue saying that capitalists who don't have much capital, and that's us, are really criminals. But uh, they do talk about the risks, the risky business of publishing that has been really handled in India by people like us, because we take risks, we build up new kinds of books, and it's the mainstream that watches. And after we've established something, they then come in and take that over, that idea, or uh, say that author. And this has been very true of women's, pub of, uh, women's studies publishing, or gender studies publishing, which was, which was really started off uh, in India by Kalipo women in uh, 1984, I think. And later they've, they've now got two separate companies, Women Unlimited, who's with us, and Zuban, who's uh, uh, with some other arrangement, distribution arrangement. Uh, and so this was really not mainstream. It was risky, it was adventurous, and it was very, very high quality. And it's only maybe in the 90s that now very, very big major publishers have made it as a matter of course to do gender studies. The same thing is happening with, with uh, studies on caste, on radical Dalit writings, which, uh, well, we, we started this list, Samya, in 1996, and we went out, uh, well, it was a risky thing to publish Kancharilaya, Why I'm Not a Hindu, which he was inspired by, uh, is it Bertrand Russell's uh, Why I'm Not a Christian? And uh, it is fairly uh, severely critical of mainstream Hinduism. And the uh, big publishers had actually turned him down. It's not that our author was radical about going with radical publishers. He wanted the mainstream. But when they turned him down, uh, he said, we'd like to publish him, and he did. Again, after he's been established for three or four years, now the mainstream is taking off. So this is a role of independent publishing that is innovative, it's pioneering, and it's very high quality. It's often acting without the funding. It's acting like, a, say, a Western University Press in India. The two established university presses in India, Oxford University Press and Cambridge University Press, aren't really as academic here as they are in their home grounds. And I would say that we, we contribute much more to scholarship than they do, and the multinational. So this is this is uh, this is not just hubris or you know overstating something. This this is, however, a precarious thing to do when you don't have the capital, and that's why you need collaboration and especially distribution. Because no matter how hard it is to publish something, it's very much harder, as you heard from other and others, to how to distribute. Now there are a number of uh, independent companies apart from our group. Uh, but uh, some uh, are linked up perhaps more as an imprint of a larger concern, which also has been seen in the West. So we won't talk about them, but only oh, these slightly permanent. Black is a very scholarly publisher, but it does its distribution through a medium sized company, which is called Orion Black Swan. Uh, Yoda is with, uh, Yoda also has a very interesting list, and it's with Cambridge University Press. Uh, Zuban, who is one of the breakaways of Kali for Women, I think is with Cambridge and Penguin. No, Penguin. Penguin. Penguin, yes. Right. So these are some of the genes. Something that was exciting was Ravi Dayal's books. And he too was sold through uh, Orient uh, Black Swan. But now, you know, after his death, I think his parents have sold it to Penguin. So independent publishing is also always changing. Some of us are up to stable but things constantly. So with unequal competition and limited capital, what are the initiatives or the kind of strategies that independent publishers should come up with? Now, already there's been a fair amount of discussion on 
distribution. And I'd like, I'd like to just emphasize the hurdle that it's very, very hard for us, despite our quality, to get into enough bookstores. Often a bookstore just won't stop. Uh, it has helped Sri and Samya to be with IDK, and so the coverage is much more. And, a, and to distribute on your own, you have to also fund that distribution. And that's hard if you're on, on your own. If you're with a group, it's much easier. Uh, on our part, we do some distribution for IDK, as you heard from Amrita and Radhika. And I thought it, it might amuse you to hear some of the ways we do this. Because again, there is no system, as I think both Radhika and Amrita uh, have said. For instance, how do you gather information of when a university gets funded? You don't actually get to know about it. It's a kind of gossip. It's a very hit and miss thing. And if you act on it, it's often true. So we started to do that. Uh, so we cover all the institutions. Uh, if need be, we do short, we do frequent trips. The, uh, our sales executive travels out frequently during the week rather than having an extended tour so that we can you know, gather this information. Uh, and that seems to have worked. You might say that th if this is difficult, why don't you do everything online? But you've seen that online actually doesn't have all the answers either. We get a lot of support from our online, can we call him our collaborator, Scholars Without Borders? And he, uh, he has a blog, he lists us, he lists all the new information on a book, and he does the e-commerce. Some of us who have websites, I mean, we spend a lot of effort in redoing this website, and that is a kind of promotion. But you know, we don't sell from our website. We just cannot handle that situation. So that gives you an idea of how small we are. I mean, three is about six people. Um, so institutional sales, rather than retail, as heard that's, that's one of the initiatives. Or not an initiative, I mean, it's an old tried system. Something that we could share uh, as a group is uh, the information on, there's this huge organization of the government called the Raja Ram Mohan Roy Library Foundation. And they're not just based in Canada or Delhi, but they're in the states, so on all the states. So if we get the information of, yes, they are, they're going to take in books, they've got the funding, then you can sell them. When we found out this information because one of our authors, who's a Gujarati, said he had resubmitted his book, which we published, to this library in Gujarat, which meant that maybe other books could have also been submitted. But by the time he told us, it was too late. So information is quite, quite a problem for uh, you know, small independent and collaboration helps. On editorial initiatives, um, we've done something recently with the Women uh, Unlimited where we've actually co-published a book together. And uh, this is, uh, this is uh, Sharala Devi Chodhurani's translation of her memoirs, Jeevan uh, Chandupasa. And she calls it, and in English it's been called, The Scattered Leaves of My Life, an Indian National Instrument. So Sharada Devi was an amazing woman, was born in 1872. She, she was a graduate in 1892, which is quite early for any, any woman in the world. Uh, she had a job in Mysore. She came from a very famous family indeed, of Rabindranath Tagore's family. She was his niece, and her mother was a, a great editor and a novelist, and that kind of thing. So at home, there was a lot of support. And at night, it's, it's interesting because of the nationalism. And so we thought that this book uh, would work very well together. And Women Unlimited signed it up, and we had come in halves on uh, dinner costs. And, and uh, then we get a certain amount of the print run to sell in our area. And following this, uh, it, uh, the Sharana Devi book is just out, so we're not quite sure how it's going to work, but we're getting good orders. Following this, we have another idea, and this time it's women in Islam. And it's called Modernities, Fundamentalisms, Islam by Zoray Ahmed. And she is really the lead thinker uh, 
Islam, which is, which is questioning the kind of Islam that has grown up since the 18th century. And she's also questioning Christianity. So we think we'll work on this together too. The logistics are tricky. We are really feeling our way. For instance, it has two logos on the title page. It has both our names, but it has to have one ISBN. So we have to sort these things out. But we think this might work. And maybe eventually the group itself will start collaborative uh, you know, publishing uh, titles together, because we have quite a lot in common. As I said, independent publishing is really quite good. Another initiative uh, that came to us directly was from Finland, and this was a women's publishing group called Into, which means zest, zest in Finnish. And I think they contacted us because we have a Finnish anthropologist as an author, and we've done two books with her. And they said that they are going to have this ebook system. They will uh, come into contract with selected Indian publishers. We get to choose the books to give to them. We get to choose the pricing as well. And uh, it's all based on a signed contract. There will be royalties. And we, we think, I thought it was a, a very good proposal. So I shared it with our IBDA friends in Delhi. And I think a lot of us are involved in this, aren't we? So that, that might, in a way, gently take us to the Indians, which we haven't mentioned. Uh, there was an Indian initiative on ebooks, which just didn't work quite as well because it didn't have this kind of commitment. It was more uh, focused on, you know, being, being a larger concern and sort of treating you not quite as an equal, and it hasn't worked for any of us, and we haven't followed it up. the traditional ways of doing books are changing. You, you don't really need uh, people to tell you that. At the same time, in India, maybe, maybe print isn't going to be dead for a while. Maybe in some ways it's good that it, it is eventually dead, because it saves a lot of trees. But in such an unequal society, uh, and we've heard about the access to this kind of brave new world, which may not be so brave now, but it's still extremely unequal. So you're going to, as an, in, as an independent publisher, I have to take all of this into account. The other thing is, how do you protect yourself from piracy, from internet piracy? It's quite hard to protect yourself from uh, the book pub piracy. I mean, we, this will come up tomorrow in the copyright session. And there are people who are very happy that copyright is disappearing. But the thing is, publishers have to pay royalties, and publishers get money from that book and survive. I mean, copyright is so um, disrespected, or people are so uninformed about it in India that I mean, we've had a case where the author himself pirated bits of his book. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, when, I, when I told him, what have you done? He said, well, uh, it is my book. I mean, it, I said, true, true, uh, most of it was your book. But the introduction that you pirated was written by somebody else. Mm -hmm. So he said, yes, but I, I, put her, I, I put her name. You know, I, I made it different. I've cut it into four pieces. And on three, I've given her name. So she will be acknowledged. So, you know, this, this situation is with a physical book. I also once was in the JNU, in the Jawaharlal Nehru University bookshop. I forgot his name, but he keeps up. Jawaharlal. Uh, the, the big one, the big one. And uh, he, he didn't know me, and I didn't know him. And as I walked in, he said, well, you are in time to see this uh, latest new book, and it was our bestseller, Why I'm Not a Hindu, which he himself had translated and printed in Hindi. And we knew nothing about it. And he had priced it at rupees 40, which is impossible for us. So 
uh, to just elaborate slightly and tell you the author's reaction, it was very mixed. He said, oh, it means then that my book is going to be read by the Hindi readers. I said, well, you don't want it to be read in this way. And he said, well, uh, as it is being read. So I said, well, no, we're going to go and see a lawyer. He said, well, I'm, I'm, let's wait a while. So if you don't have support from the author who's been pirated, you really can't do anything legally. Eventually, we did a, a, a Hindi translation ourselves, but we haven't been able to price it at what price. So that, that's when it's a physical book. Uh, piracy across the border in Bangladesh is terrifying. I think both Pakistan and Bangladesh haven't signed the, the old Bar Convention and other treaties. And sometimes if you've sold a rights deal to a Bangladeshi publisher, it's quite curious how uh, you'd never get asked about a reprint. But the edition, you know, the print run just continues and continues and continues. So I don't know what happens at the internet. I mean, I'd be happy to get advice on this. I think when you, when you are in a collaborative situation, you get so much support because we independent, as I said, we are small and we work in our small offices with our heads down on the book. And we are quite isolated. I'm quite isolated in, in Canada where I'm seen, seen as an aging and sentient. I mean, <laughs> and uh, so it's a relief to say if you're in a, in a pickle over, over a proposal, you suddenly came from Germany where they want uh, two or three pages of a translation from Gujarati. Yes, the same author that had submitted it to that library in Ahmedabad. And they say, but we don't want it in a book form. We're going to put it in a CD, and it's going to teach English to Germans. I mean, it's an anthology. But there'll be a teacher's manual with it, which will be a book. So you don't quite know how to charge them for this. You don't know anything about it. But you can find out from the internet. You know, there are huge um, German educational companies. But really, I got so much helpful information from my colleagues and then you know, we could work out a rate. Because, as I said, it's really information where you're at a loss. I mean, say the first time I went to Frankfurt to sell rights, I really didn't know how much to ask for when someone said, yes, we do like this book. You just don't know the rates and things like that. So collaboration is a survival uh, strategy and you really, have to be together or you will go under. Um, the other thing about um, independent publishing is that we don't have much visibility. I mean, I may count my chest and say we are very, very good and the best in India. And there are people who recognize this, but the general, say the informed public opinion of India that's reading all these newspapers and online or whatever, don't really get to know about too much because actually you heard Radhika talk about reviews. We actually don't get reviews. It's very hard to find uh, one of our books reviewed because even that space is saturated by the huge multinational. If you pick up a copy of Biblio or um, you know the Hindu, which is serious about reviewing, <coughs> you don't really see us that much. Occasionally, maybe. So we're not really visible. So a conference like this does make us visible. And I think it, it's a very marvelous thing for publishing in many ways to do for us. So we need to be visible and we need, we need to survive. And that is because we want diversity and quality in publishing. And you don't just want something that a multinational has decided or a larger company in India who is scared to take risks so that what, the, what they are publishing is not exciting. It's very dark but it can be safe. Discussion going. Uh, any comments, responses, questions to any of the presentations? Actively, are you looking at new media 
uh, like ebooks, like electronic publishing, like distribution over the internet, rather than through distribution, uh, traditional distribution channels. Sorry, uh, before the answer, could you please identify yourself? Sorry, my name is Anish Traveri and I'm here as an author. Radhika, will you take that? Um, is it on? Yeah. Um, you know, we are, I'm really taking, uh, uh, I see online sales as a, as a, as a, um, a real hope, uh, where, um, you know, we can, we can directly reach out to our uh, readers and uh, buyers, and, uh, but certainly not uh, exclusive uh, to the online sales with distribution and with uh, uh, bookstores, uh, independent bookstores, non-bookstores, I mean, all of that, which is what my uh, chart was all about. It's, it cannot be given the Indian context, the kind of um, readership we are uh, addressing. We have to be there everywhere. Online, certainly. I mean, if this, uh, I think the big super um, uh, book chains are close to us. But the online space has opened up. That's how I see it. And uh, apps and ebooks, yes, we're talking about children's books. I can only really talk about, uh, you know, our kind of publishing, yes, because we are addressing children. Children are taking to that space more and more, and we can't ignore that space. So we have to get into it. I, I heard what you had to say this morning. Yeah. But could I just ask specifically about, uh, about imprints like Spree, for instance? Uh, yes. How you're going to address that market? Yes, we are already selling online. I mean, not directly. Uh, not directly because we don't have the wherewithal. I think online sales have to be attended to immediately, and you can't say right now because <coughs> on Friday is Miss Tuesday. But we use a lot of online, um, I mean, the usual. There's some for Flipkart, there's some for A1, and our own. Um, Dollars without borders does the online sales. I think online sales are a must uh, because we ourselves notice in Canada that the retail orders from bookshops are coming down to a trickle. And we hear a real grief from old bookshops uh, saying that, I mean, there's no footfall. I mean, he's sitting there all day, and as they say in Bengali, Machi Tarachi, which means I'm chasing the flies. And there's, uh, there's no sale, and his children have already got themselves other careers. So retail, I think, is just as much under threat here as in the West, and might well disappear. So online, it has to be. Where we are less uh, sure-footed is this e-book. Now, uh, we have started doing it, and I think on demand is also a very good thing. So all these things we are going to have to shake off our hesitation and, and you know, get started this week, that kind of thing. Uh, E-books, at first our strategy was to do slightly older books which we can't reprint and uh, they ought to be reprinted but there is demand. But I noticed into the Finnish uh, publisher who's doing e-books with us really wants the latest books. Now we don't know how to handle this. Can you have a current ebook edition and your physical edition? And I think I asked somebody, how do you price this thing? I mean, into says, go ahead and price your book. But we don't know how to price that book. So it's going to be a bit of a, a rocky ride, but we are going to have to do this or we don't exist anymore. I think that, that's very clear to us. The other thing about not existing is frankly age. I mean, if younger people aren't going to come in and take on this independent publishing, what happens to you? Just to add a small point, you know, about uh, online sales. Uh, I think if online sales and e-books may uh, answer the need of a segment of the market. Traditionally, academic publishing and serious uh, uh, non-academic publishing as well. Uh, the main buyers are institutions and libraries in our country. I don't know, I mean, I, I, Mr. Balani is, is a veteran in this field, but I fail to understand what he 
told us this morning, which is that, uh, you know, an average librarian, uh, I mean, I'll have to be enlightened on this, an average library in a metropolis uh, in our country, uh, in one of the largest universities, uh, you know, systems of our country, uh, will not even look at a e-catalog that you send him. He still depends on printed catalog. He will refuse to order on the basis of anything that is electronic. So, I mean, there is this, and it's not to do with corruption. It's to do with the systems in place. That's one problem. The next problem is uh, students do not. I mean, this whole, I think it's a myth. Digital penetration in our country has to be studied. Statistics have to be put out there. And we have uh, people who tell us uh, the story in one way because it suits them. Uh, and we have people who look at it another way because they have, I think, very genuine skepticism about how, whether this whole thing is a story of digital overreach. And as Mandira mentioned, uh, in an unequal society of ours, we have to look very carefully at how many <coughs> educated young people have access to even the hardware, a computer, uh, uh, you know, to access these resources that exist in the form of software. These are serious questions, and I'm not, I'm not junking one at the expense of the other, but I think these are serious questions that we haven't got convincing answers for, let me put it that way, and we need to gather as much information, share as much information as we can uh, from within the publishing industry, from outside the publishing industry in terms of allied services. Time zones. I mean, we have the ancient, maybe even as a model, and maybe a bit of the future going on together, side by side. You probably will have to cater uh, to people who don't have this, uh, uh, who are not, uh, you know, computer savvy for a while. Our books in Bengali, which are which are uh, social science, uh, have a different marketing system, and uh, if, if you take us away from the privileged English-speaking elite <coughs> into perhaps the next level of towns and uh, you know, district headquarters. And I think that's very interesting. Uh, our promotion, uh, our, our physical promotion, you know, the sense of sending out mailing, once we got quite quite an interesting feedback. We got, we got orders. We didn't get, I can't say there are orders. There were more pleading letters from a couple of prisons the man says, I want to read this book, but I can't pay for it. So we did give him a free copy, but then we had to stop because we got several such letters from the same <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. I'm Vikinesh, I'm an internal entrepreneur and also from your story. So my question is, uh, are independent publishers profitable? Are they making money enough to sustain their operations? And how long did Tulika take to become profitable? And what keeps you going even if you're not profitable? He's asking us to share information. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> money where our mouth is. Um, I'm trying to think. Maybe five years since we've been profitable. We're showing profits. But uh, 10 years is a long time to struggle, <laughs> and we did. But um, found other ways of, uh, we did diaries and calendars, and we did all kinds of things and, uh, uh, to sustain this whole thing. And uh, here we are. And uh, we, there's still no uh, sitting back. Like when we were discussing, I was telling Mandira what all this means is that we're on our toes constantly. Yes, yes. There is no sitting back and saying, OK, we've created the market. Now we publish 2,000 copies, it will sell in two years, no way. Meaning online, no online, I don't think there's no signal value. I think quality publishing uh, has never actually made profits. The margins are very small. That is why <coughs> the big uh, multinationals uh, aren't into doing this kind of publishing at all. I, I, when you have pioneers like uh, Andre Shippen, who's, I don't know, how old he would be now, but he was a real pioneer and he found his, I think, Pantheon uh, books in, uh, in New York. And he talks about the margin being 5% and it hasn't changed. I think what we look out 
done was to make sure that that we do not make a loss on the book. Uh, and we haven't so far. They're viable. careful about the print runs. So we are viable but not comfortable. Or, or as uh, the accountant told me, we are viable because I get a low salary. And less than anyone in the office, that kind of thing. Uh, and, and we can't have frills like if I go to one foreign book fair, I can't go to another, that kind of thing. So everything is tight. The overheads can't be trimmed anymore. I, there is an initiative I forgot to mention, which was uh, Kulika's uh, DTP. And I think that at one stage was in a crisis. She does all the proofs and the design and the proofs uh, setting. And we all thought we would then give the books to her in the type setting, which would make it more viable. And that would also help us. So all along the line, I mean, as Radhika says, you're thinking of saving something or cutting something, and you can't really cut anymore. I mean, uh, for instance, there's somebody who works part-time and would really help us to make her full-time if we had to cut, uh, that kind of thing. So yes, it is. I think the excitement comes because we've uh, seduced ourselves to thinking that we live in this world of ideas. And, and if we are honest, we we'll say that our spouses do earn decent salaries and keep the family going. And this came home to me once. I went to give a lecture at Steger, and I was handed a, a, a nice amount of money to my surprise. So when I came home, I gave it to the two kids. <coughs> So things are always very, very uh, money-wise. It's always going to be small scale. Yeah, good What about um, individual authors who publish a book or two? Um, the main problem they're facing is the distribution, um, and some of the publishers, small-time publishers, really are not doing a good job. My so, oh, okay. So I was saying, what about independent authors who publish a book or two, and would um, IDPA um, help in, in helping those independent authors distribute the books? Yes, certainly, because <clears throat> the categories that we do, which are social sciences, fiction, nonfiction, and children, um, we generally ask the authors to send books to us. We go through them, we have a team. And then if it fits in our uh, portfolio, we certainly take our distribution. But I think one thing that you have to be realistic about, um, because we have faced this, is that you know when you publish with one of us, or uh, distribute, or publishers like us, distribute to IPDA, you don't get the kind of visibility that an author hopes to get, what you talked about in the morning. When we've had this complaint time and again, we walk into bookstores, though the royalty statements are pretty healthy, I mean the royalty what they get is pretty healthy because the books have sold, but they're not visible. So there is an issue there, so even as authors, that you have to be uh, realistic about that when you come you know, with, with an IP. And there is absolutely no guarantee that you get this because you have penguin authors complaining of the same thing yeah. unless you know they are big time authors. Well, the, the other two well, well it wasn't directly with this it was on our low income. One reason why we have low income is that we are all punctilious in paying royalties. And I can tell you that there are a lot of larger publishers in India who don't pay royalties. If we didn't pay royalties, we'd be doing pretty fine. But we don't <laughs> Absolutely, you know, royalty payment, I mean, uh, in terms of good practices, I think in addition to what, I mean, I think collaboration as a strategy is for survival and uh, for visibility. Uh, IPDA, and there is a, a kind of mandate that we've given ourselves, which is to try and not only follow good practices ourselves, but also try and influence the Indian publishing industry, as it were, to follow certain norms. Some of those norms are flouted willingly, knowingly, some of those norms are flouted because of lack of knowledge. It's 
especially in language partition. And the other thing is, uh, uh, Kirbal, just, just to answer your point, I'm, just to clarify the point, IPDA does, I mean, none of the publishers who distribute with IPDA distribute exclusively with IPDA. That's also been one of our early, uh, uh, you know, kind of unwritten rule, that IPDA as an entity will work towards exclusivity with the publishers it represents, but to begin with will not insist on exclusivity. quite conscious where we are sending our books, right? Even though if Babylon has 20 bookshops, probably we only work with eight or nine. Because uh, <coughs> for us, we do want to be with the bookstores and understand our books and not just have them on the shelves and finally get them back as returns. So it's a very conscious, consciously done thing. And the whole team which travels, generally get orders and that's how the books are supplied. So you will not find yourself in all the bookstores. The, the major ones, you cover the major ones? Yeah, we do. Depends on what you put yeah. in there. <laughs> yeah, even uh, any particular book, uh, generally the team knows which are the particular stores which will sell them well. Out of, if we are doing 10, out of that maybe a particular book will go only to four stores and not all 10. Yeah, you had questions. Then I was talking about the next generation. My name is Satya Narayan. I'm from New Horizon Media. Mandira uh, was talking about the next generation of independent publishers. So, do you see people on the horizon, or you know, is that something that can be done to, you know, induce people to come into publishing, <coughs> independent publishing? Well, we have a next generation amongst us. He's not present at the conference. He's called uh, S. Anand. generation of independent publishers in India, and there will always be. I, I don't think, uh, some of us do despair that our own individual efforts may not be carried on after our lifetime, as it were. So in that sense, that, you know, but then on the other hand, why the hell should it? Because, I mean, we are not into, fam I mean, independent publishing in India has a long history after all. All our family-owned publishing houses are also independent publishers. I mean, it's not as if, uh, you know, we only, uh, some of the early Indian efforts at publishing were all independent, but family business as it were. Well. So 
So there are a whole lot of facets to this. But there are enough young people to carry on the business of independent publishing, I think. Children's publishing, there's, there are many more. I, mean, I met a couple of them here, and uh, yeah, a lot of uh, design students, and you know, very interested in various aspects and kind of companies. The British Council had a young publisher entrepreneurial award system, and maybe we have one of them who's organized this conference. <laughs> Yeah, any more questions? Um, hi, uh, I'm Padmini. I'm an editor with a literary magazine in Bangalore. I'm much younger than anybody I'm guessing. But uh, on a similar tangent to this about uh, young publishers not taking up the reins, uh, what would you say about uh, publishing houses like Blaft in Chennai who come out with these graphic novels and targeted towards a much younger crowd? Uh, do you think they're sort of taking the easy way out by trying to please a generation who will buy more and sort of breaking, trying to make a profit faster? It's a very important uh, segment of publishing. They're doing very fine. I think Draft is doing very fine work in, uh, in a certain segment of publishing. There's no easy way out in publishing. It's open. So there's no problem there at all. We were, and we, by the way, what we said was that there are enough young people. I don't think there's a problem with uh, the young generation not being in publishing. There are enough young people, and Draft, as you said, is a And publishing in the publishing companies is filled with young people. So who knows how they will, you know, what trajectory they will take. I mean, um, I mean Delhi publishing is with young Bengalis who have been very well because we have no jobs. And there they are in all the companies. So who knows what happens there? I think there is one problem. I mean, how do you attract young people to publishing? I think that's an important question to pose. And if um, Satyanayan's question was posed in that direction, there are enough uh, training programs, internships, etc., for uh, young people who want to become journalists, okay, in any of the, the print or electronic media or new age media, new media. But uh, publishing, unfortunately, there are very few efforts to actually train young generations of uh, professionals who can enter the publishing industry and uh, then go on to whichever aspect of publishing they may want. And, uh, I mean, there are, of course, there are some efforts. Jadapur University has its, uh, you know, course in publishing now. And there are some, there are odd efforts here and there. And this is something probably that, uh, for instance, a new university in Delhi, Ambedkar University has a publishing program. Uh, NBC traditionally has conducted <laughs> uh, publishing uh, courses. It, I mean, they're, they're not linked to an academic institution. They, uh, uh, yeah, and there are other associations and uh, private, uh, so there are publishing uh, training workshops, courses that are conducted, but nothing that is sustained and I suspect not of good enough quality and definitely not widespread enough and not for the languages probably. I think all of these address English language. There's a lot of interest. We've always worked with interns. It's a lot of interest in. Uh, I suspect that has to do with uh, children's publishing um, more than the other kind of publishing <coughs> as much. We really have interns year-round, and the most from the design schools and you know interested in illustrating, but of, um, and designing. But of late, um, editing and marketing, marketing particularly, many. People are getting, youngsters are getting interested and want to do internship. I think that's a good way of learning the profession. Uh, my name is Preeti Vyas, and I just started a new publishing company. It's called Fun of Kate. Uh, we do children's books. And uh, just in 
sort of an answer to what Anish, the point that you raised about the online space and what are young people doing and looking at. And I just wanted to say that this is a really exciting time for <coughs> independent publishers or young people to get into publishing for two main reasons. Uh, both offered on the same platform, which is the internet. One is the online retailers. I don't think that many of us would be aware that uh, Flipkart.com sold as many books as the crossword chain last year. That is huge for a single, uh, so, and it's only growing, and crossword is not growing at the same rate that Flipkart is growing. And as customers, all of us have experienced, you know, a book coming to your doorstep in two days, beautifully packaged, good condition, it's only going to grow. So as an independent publisher, there's a finally a chance that you are, uh, the frustration that we face with the retail chains of, you know, randomly not uh, stopping their purchases and things like that. Uh, this is actually a real chance at uh, making your book visible. The second big reason is that marketing is finally a possibility. It's, the online world is a great leveling field. You don't really need that much money to uh, to advertise. You, know, you need a quirky idea, you need to create a buzz, use YouTube, and make yourself heard. And then direct that traffic to a site like Flipkart. So if you're willing to work hard, which I guess has always been the rule for you know, any game, uh, this is actually a, a really great time to be in this. Uh, that's how I look at it. Winston, uh, just wanted to learn from uh, Tulika's experience of uh, content creation in one language and probably you bring it the same content in nine languages. <coughs> What's your experience? Can you? I mean, I can't answer that in one line. It's, we're still learning. It's it's uh, been huge what we have learned, in, and I think. Um, it has, it has, uh, because we publish in so many languages um, at a at the larger level or the uh, you know overall kind of thing, we have um, learned more and more about what Indian books are and what Indian <coughs> content is. Um, I'll, I'll talk to you later if you want me to explain what that means. But it really has been, which includes the language, the um, the kind of language used, translations, uh, the kind of problems that languages bring when you, you know, translate because of the you know, politics of language is huge, and you know, how do you deal with that uh, when you when you translate? Uh, just simple gender problems. I mean, you just don't have a gen for farmer is always a he and not a she. I forget which language in several languages. So you know, we just have to show a woman as a farmer and then deal with it. And you know, a little problem, but constantly learning, constantly learning. And uh, apart from that, just, just the production, this whole, which is why I'm so skeptical about the te you know, new technologies and how it, it's, yes, it's fine for the English language and the Roman script, but what about languages? Even today, in, in um, on page layout and so on, we, uh, you know, people scoff at us because we use PageMaker, but it's the PageMaker that deals with the, I meaning sort of, that doesn't, um, not a way out for all problems, but a lot of the problems. Because I suspect the newer and newer um, layout and design um, software just can't deal with uh, language models, especially when you can. What most language publishers, we try to learn from them, what they do is stick to two or three. And for us, the font used is as much part of the visual as uh, and the reading experience. We do that in English, so why not in the languages? So we experiment with the fonts, but then go horribly wrong because sometimes the matras will just disappear by the time. And this whole technology, the film in printing, you don't have um, you know films being processed anymore. It's CTPs from the computer to plate, and you know in that. Short journey, markers disappear, letters change to hyphens. It really is a nightmare, and we're still struggling with it. Uh, when we think we've solved one problem, there's another problem cropping up. So, um, which is why I don't know about uh, languages and uh, uh, the new technology for apps and ebooks and so on. If I may add, I think the expansion is really going to be in the Indian how much of that is in the ego format, but that, that's where the literacy movements are, that's where the uh, adult adults are, and that's, that's where the serious one is. My name is Gerard Bikuna, I'm an architect. 
uh, got into publishing accidentally because I couldn't find a publisher to do a book I wanted to. Uh, the question I want to ask is, what kind of, I, I've now done nine books, one after the other, but I, the question is, what, a, what is an economical print run? How many books do you print, or what's the logic of it? Do you sell, you print enough books to be sold in two years, one year, three years? This, sometimes the print run of a book is led by printing costs, as we know uh, for physical books, that is. And that's one thing an, an e-book can need not worry about, which is quite wonderful. But uh, all printing costs are per thousand. So there was a time in the old days when all the fixed costs would be per thousand, and you have to pay only running costs for every extra book that you print. So for instance, paper costs would go up proportionate to the number of books, but your film costs would remain the same, whether it was one or a thousand, your plate costs would remain the same, etc. So 1,000 used to be in the golden age of publishing, as it were, uh, an average print run. Of course, uh, in academic, I mean, I'll talk about academic publishing, maybe Mangira Radhika can talk about uh, uh, fiction and uh, trade publishing and children's publishing. Uh, in academic publishing, that first uh, 1,000 came down to 750 in my lifetime within publishing, which spans about 30 years now. So uh, from uh, 1000 in uh, the early 80s, it came down to 750. Uh, by the time I set up my own publishing house, it was 750 in most other major academic publishers, and I stuck to 1000. Uh, and then I had to revise my first hardback edition print run down to 750 when they came to 500. And I think now we're at a stage when a lot of Indian academic, scholarly academic publishers print an average of even as low as 300 books because warehousing costs and holding stocks if you do not have an exclusive distribution, which is not a problem that publishers of all face um, because many of their uh, distributors are also stockists. But if you have to you know, warehouse your own stocks, that's the real calculation you have to make. If your warehousing stocks do not uh, wear you down literally, uh, then you can afford to, you know, bring out a printer. And then the shelf life of a book, if you do not, we, we were taught this, we were trained in this, and I think it's still true for academic publishing. If you do not sell at least 50% of your print run, whatever that may be, within the first year, and I'm talking only of academic scholarly publishing, um, then you should get worried and revise the print run for the next book that you're doing in that particular year. It's also much easier to reprint for a number of years. So low print runs have been, I think, the norm for the past maybe 10 years. Lower print runs than uh, 1,000. And paper costs have gone up. So paper costs went up, then now they've come down again. You know, paper costs, I mean, of the inputs, paper is one of the costs, strangely enough, that have not, uh, and I'm saying all this only because I've also been involved with production. I mean, with, uh, like someone mentioned, I, uh, we started Tudika as a TTP typesetting unit, which then started offering print packaging services, as it were. And we, this was before we started our own publishing. So we would work for other publishers, which meant that we would take a raw material, uh, the raw manuscript, edit it, typeset it, design it, layout, and undertake print jobs as well, which is when we got into the economics and viability of print production, which came in very handy when we started our own publishing because we had a certain base to work with. But paper costs, within that experience, to my mind, uh, there was a stage maybe about four or five years ago when the prices really rocked. And uh, now they've come down and they've kind of settled at a fairly comfortable level. It's not as bad as it was. I was uh, eager to, to know a little bit more about uh, the levels of, of print run, in particular in languages other than English in, uh, in India, but, but also perhaps about the kind of uh, publishing you were talking about, Mandira, as well. Are you talking also about, the le uh, about levels of around 1,000 print run? Uh, one of the constraints we face is uh, 
is that the competition on the Bengali book market, the prices are much lower than really suit us. So uh, we consciously went away from hardbound books just because in Calcutta it costs us about uh, 32 rupees to hardbound book. It's very beautifully hand done, but that adds to the book's price. So we have paperback generally, but our prices are still high. So uh, the paperback is less than a thousand rupees, like uh, what uh, Indu was saying, he prints 750. Uh, and uh, the distribution is not that easy. Uh, it, within the, the, the city of Calcutta, I think people prefer, I don't know what's happening, but the tastes are changing and they're not reading enough nonfiction in Bengali and they can read it in English. But uh, so the sales seem to be better outside the city, which is what one would have thought. Yeah. And we, we are very, very keen on uh, regional language publishing. I mean, we're we not overwhelmed by what the elites and their partial for the English language tell us. We're kind of cussed. Now, we don't do creative writing in English. We do find little translations from the Indian languages into English, and that's when we sell fiction and non-fiction. So that is where, and those do quite well. This is merely an observation. Um, I've spent the last 15 years running radio stations and working very closely with the music industry internationally. And from what I'm hearing from everyone in the audience and, uh, and on the platform, uh, you've got the same problems that we had in the music industry, uh, both in India and internationally, 15 years ago. It took us 10 years to solve the problem. Uh, we kept hearing over 15 years about the long tail in music and how we were supposed to to, to be able to capture it, and it took 10 years for us to do it. Um, with things like the Independent Online Distributors Association uh, in the US, and uh, purely as an observation, uh, I'm here for the next couple of days, and I'd be very happy to share the experience that we went through uh, with music, uh, because it seems to me you're in the same position that we were in, uh, regrettably 10 years behind uh, even the music industry, which is, God forbid, still five years behind what the consumer wants. So um, I'll be very happy to, to share what I can and see if it makes your lives any easier. Thank you. I'm a printer by profession, and uh, we have the ability of uh, digital, print, digital printing, which can print from one copy up to maybe any number of copies, because we have offset printing also. So as a printer, um, I would like to ask you how you would like a printer to be equipped so that uh, we can partner in a better way to uh, counter the challenges. Like she said, this page maker, now we have InDesign and several other softwares. Um, we are compatible uh, in every respect. But what else do you expect as a publisher from us? I would like to know. One of the things that we're really missing, um, I, Indu and I, were, I mean, started Kulika together when she was talking about uh, print and production, uh, pre-press and production, and the kind of I, I have no had no publishing background. Um, teacher, I, I was a teacher, and then I got into this uh, with Indu, and uh, all that I learned about printing were from the, uh, the from the presses. And um, the way they worked, you know, it was like magic. Then they could get the right color because, you know, these people were there at the machine uh, looking at the colors, being able to advise us and, you know, about the paper, about, even about the colors given and so on. So I just took it for granted when I moved to Chennai. And uh, it was, there were printers who did that, so it continued. But suddenly there was this whole, um, uh, you know, technological uh, revolution that came in and these new printers and, you know, we were taken around presses to say, look at our presses and, you know, just hit a button there 
and the form comes out and you have the colors and so on. And we just got their own colors. And when uh, asked, you know, they would always tell us, well, that's what it is, it's all computerized. And you know, we would beg them to, you know, why can't you adjust colors like it was done earlier? You give them the artwork, you look at it, and you color, you, you know, correct it manually. But they just refuse to do that. And now, after so many years more, there's nobody we can even uh, speak to about that because that generation of printers are just not there. There's nobody standing. In fact, there are silent air conditioned uh, rooms where the printing goes on, and we say. I really miss that, and there's really still a gap. Maybe um, in Singapore and wherever all the printing is happening, these things happen, but the kind of presses we can afford, and they do a good job. Our books are always uh, you know, appreciated for the kind of production values, but we know that it's falling short because when you look at the artwork, there is a problem. And uh, well, there's nothing you can do to solve it, but. Uh, maybe printers who understand the process a little more and it's not just all about technology but it was also an art you know getting the right colors suggesting the right paper the process and so on and there are one or two printers like that we really value i would like to uh, just inform the house that the, the the print runs for example nowadays are not fixed at all especially the foreign publishers what they do is now they will just send a circulation, circulation to distributors and depending on the number of the books or the orders they've collected, they will give a print run on a print on demand, in fact, even for the new, new titles. So, so there is no, it could be just 100 copies, 500 <coughs> copies, no warehousing at all nowadays. And that trend is going to come in India also very soon, uh, where the print runs have come down to even 300 copies, as you rightly said. But print on demand is, uh, I'm talking about uh, academic uh, reference books. It's, it's very low. Uh, big publishers like uh, Elsevier Science, for example, they do not even print encyclopedias anymore. They're just only e editions. So that's a trend which is, uh, you know, we have to, really have to think about. Thank you. We, we get an indication of this when, when there's, say, uh, a copyright permission request from abroad. <coughs> They're doing a book and they want, say, a chapter or part of your book. And then that uh, fee is calculated on the basis of their print run, their pricing, the kind of edition, and how many years. And I think in one of the recent ones, as you said, uh, they, they, um, they are hoping this edition will last three years. And they are doing about 300 copies. It's a huge uh, anthology on religion. Thank you all. I think if there are no other pressing questions, we can uh, close this session, go to tea, come back to the next. And uh, I think it's been a useful session. We've been able to exchange some thoughts. Thank you, Anish, did I get your name right, for your offer. And uh, maybe we can ask Leo to, you know, factor in a slot for you tomorrow or later today. Uh, <laughs> Uh, five minutes of your uh, of your uh, experience in the music industry, which may be useful to all of us. Thank you.